Good evening, um, guests, visitors, colleagues, the university management. I feel particularly honoured to have the rector here. I feel honoured by people having travelled to be here from far and from near. Um, this, this, this is a particularly special moment for me personally in my own academic life. I, I'm honoured by people from outside of the academy being here too. Um, I started university on the day in 1982 that Neil Agate, who was a trade union organiser and an anti-apartheid activist, died in detention. Now, while I was a schoolboy, Glenwood Boys High in Durban, I'd kind of learnt in a general sort of cry the beloved sense about the injustices and the wrongness of apartheid. But Neil Agate had the same name as me. He looked like me, except that he sported a beard. Um, and his death represented the moment when I realised, I think when I really realised, that apartheid killed people. And I began to appreciate something of the brutality, the dispossession, and the dehumanisation which it wrought. Now at the University of Natal in Durban, I was soon caught up in the, in the heady temperaments of, of, of of student resistance to apartheid. And one of the things that attracted me to the discipline of history was the obvious and urgent connections that some historians drew between their historical research and anti-apartheid politics. And most particularly, I admired the social historians at Witz who were writing about what they called hidden histories of South Africa, about black life, about resistance to colonialism, segregation and apartheid. Now, since the time I became a postgraduate, I've worked in one way or another on histories of whites. Um, and in the late 1980s, and seized by the sort of political and historiographic spirit of the time, as Dean Hudson has said, I did my master's work on white communists and their role in the Springbok Legion and the Congress of Democrats and a little bit of work on the move to armed resistance against apartheid. By the time I started my doctorate, though, things had changed. The Camelot sense of the Mandela presidency was nearing its end and there was a new spirit of African nationalism on the ascendant. And the big questions of the day seemed to revolve around development, around Africa's modernity, and the ideal of the African Renaissance. And the political urgency to write histories about activists um, in little known reaches of the struggle, particularly white activists, was frankly gone. And realizing that the men and women in the Springbok Legion and the Congress of Democrats um, along with the type of resistance they undertook, were actually something of an exception, a tiny exception in white society. I began, began to become more interested in the majority of white South Africans who actually didn't oppose apartheid or segregation. And I looked first at white men who volunteered to serve in the military during the Second World War, and then and it seems a very long then because it's gone on forever. I became interested in histories of broader, mainly working class swathes of white society under apartheid. And more recently, I've begun writing about post-apartheid iterations of white identity and racial violence. Histories of the present, if you like. Now, histories of whites in Africa is fraught historiographically and politically and morally and for this reason, it's remained a deeply unfashionable topic in African history and certainly in the more progressive reaches of South African history writing. As far back as the 1960s, when African history began to develop as a serious field in Western academies, Frederick Cooper, one of the, one of the leading figures in African history, noted that for his generation of Africanists um, who were educated mainly in British and American universities, pre-colonial history or resistance to colonialism were genuine African history, while an interest in the colonial state or society, including whites who lived in colonial societies, risked having your work being labelled as, I quote, a throwback to imperial history. Now, 
50 years later, the winds of decolonization have blasted through South African universities and protagonists who identify with decolonization have demanded the overthrow of, of, of those European intellectual traditions that privilege Western or white authors and perspectives and which place white people at the very center of history. Now between these two commentaries, half a century apart, one from America and one from here, I want to explore in tonight's lecture whether there's any abiding or broader historical, political, pedagogical value in studying South African whites. Something more than another hidden history, another niche history, another slava of apartheid minute. And if there is any value, what would this history look like? And this raises a second objective for the lecture. In my career as a historian, I've always identified with the social history movement, although I wasn't a Witz person. Um, and I know that I'm not alone in experiencing a sense of disappointment at the decline of social history from the 1990s. This was brought on by some of the analytic dead ends which a uh, type of history writing founded on certain types of Marxism ran up against. It was also brought on by the dismissal of social history's intellectual, political and pedagogical projects by a new vanguard of scholars who were steeped in post-colonial theory and often the methodologies of literary criticism. And finally, by very real limitations of social history's capacity to predict, to mobilize, to build coalitions a kind of, around the kind of political battles that emerged in the, in, the, in the millennium. And I think particularly of the rise of, of militant, conservative, white, masculine politics in countries in North America and Western Europe. So, as I reflect on how histories of whites have been written in this country and ponder how they might be, I simultaneously grapple with the directions of South African social history at a time when its legacies seem consigned more to the realms of nostalgia than ones of action and analyses. And there's a third objective tonight to thank Ros Posel. Ros was a lecturer in history at the Howard College campus at the University of Natal. And in her class, mean, classes many years ago, I found a place where simultaneously there was calm and also excitement. And it was the first place at the university where I was ever actually asked, invited to ask a question. I did many courses with her, but a few stand out. In my third year, she taught a course on European totalitarianism, which was probably the most challenging course I'd ever done, as she drew on theoretical and empirical components. She introduced us to, to that strange beast called comparative history, and she drew on interdisciplinary methods, this in a history department in the 1980s. Now, Ros demonstrated something else. She brought a great passion to her subject. She was always keen to emphasize how important it was that the questions we ask of the past, and this was even to sort of dull undergraduates like myself at a provincial university like Natal, that these questions matter intellectually, politically, ethically, and morally. And under Ros, I began to see something of the beauty, the ugliness, the commanding power of history, a love affair with the discipline that shaped my adult life. And in addition to the political engagement I saw elsewhere in the discipline, Ros's teaching was another factor that drew me to history. She taught about the dangers of fascism and authoritarianism and the slippery slope towards these, and how they take root in institutions, in society, in popular ideas, in the way parties mobilize others, how how authoritarianism and fascism seize hold of nationalisms. And these, of course, are lessons which we cannot underestimate today. I don't believe Roz received the professional recognition which she deserved. And I know that I never thanked her properly. So, tonight I dedicate this lecture to her. The lecture will develop in three parts, and I must emphasize that it's by no means meant to be a comprehensive overview of the way in which
Whites have featured in South African historiographies. Other people have done that in ways far more comprehensively than I can ever do. And it starts with the social history movement in the 1980s. And in a section called Possibility, I describe the political contexts in which South African Marxist social history emerged, the kind of history which came out of it, and how whites featured in that, in that oeuvre of history writing. In the next section, called Dismay, I uh, chart the decline of social history and the, the kinds of culturally oriented whiteness studies that emerged in South Africa in about the, the first decade of this millennium. And in the third, for me, most salient part of the lecture called Challenge, I propose that a new history of race, in this case whites, can revitalize South African social history both historiographically and theoretically and connect it to the types of activism, the types of insurgency that gave rise to earlier versions of social history. So, on to possibility. By the 1980s, a Marxist grounded social history that was inspired by British and North American Marxists like E.P. Thompson, Eric Hobsbawm and Eugene Genovese had begun to make inroads into the South African Academy, mainly at Witts University through the Witts History Workshop. Now, many of the social historians working in that group were deeply committed to the overthrow of apartheid. And in the popular struggles of the 1980s, they championed the use of history as a mobilizing tool, a kind of activist insurgent history that drew me to the discipline. This agenda led them generally to disregard the history of whites. After all, these historians were interested in the plight of the most oppressed and in the revolutionary or potentially revolutionary classes in South Africa. And to be sure, the racist and reactionary nature of most whites, including the white working class, seemed pretty obvious. Now, a few general points about the kind of history which these historians wrote. Firstly, they, conv they convincingly diagnosed that the features of 20th century racial supremacy and racial discrimination in South Africa were tied to the particular development of capitalism in this country. Secondly, not dissimilar to British Marxist social historians, they demonstrated considerable irritation with high theory. Um, this contributed to the empirical richness, the fact that they got lots of facts in their work. Um, but I think it ultimately made their approaches quite inflexible and unable to respond to the theoretical and historiographic critiques and also the changing circumstances, particularly the end of the Soviet Union and the, the I suppose, the moral bankruptcy which seemed to confront Marxism. Now, although they were not the first or the only ones to do so, they also presented a model of scholarship where, through peeling open hidden histories and demonstrating people's agency and ability to organize and resist in the face of daunting odds, their research had a strong activist, a strong pedagogical or teaching component. Some certainly did write about whites. Early on, some scholarship in this tradition, most particularly that written by Charles von Onselen, explored the complexity of white society and the struggles of the white poor against mine owners, against urban planning authorities, against rural notables. Albert Krundling, who's here tonight, from slightly outside of the Witz group, did substantial work on the social history of hence-uppers and joiners among the Republican armies during the South African War, also on poor white woodcutters in the Eastern Cape, and later he did work on rugby. Now, by the 1990s, some of the social historians had indeed begun to take on whiteness, the idea of generalized racial supremacy, as a historical and histor historiographic problem. Robert Morell, when he was eventually able to prize the contributions out of the authors, put together a pretty groundbreaking book called White But Poor. Deborah Posel wrote on white civil servants. John Hislop wrote on white laborism in the development of a self-consciously white imperial working class. And these histories were, I think, 
beginning to be influenced by David Rodiger's work. And where is David? By David Rodiger's work. To the, in the sense that they all sought to connect class formation and race formation. In other words, it was quite a sophisticated understanding of race. And they generally took on the social, the, the idea of the social wage of whiteness, although I'm not entirely sure that this part of Rodiger's thesis works here. Certainly there were social wages, but histories of racialized class struggle had given white workers in this country a color bar and very real and substantial money wages and class advantages over black workers. Now then in 2001 there was a conference organized by the Witz History Workshop called Whiteness and Blackness in Modern South Africa, or was it Blackness and Whiteness? I can't quite remember. I also don't recall many papers on whiteness and its histories at that conference or any big conceptual advances, but it did signify the emergence of whiteness studies as a field of interest among some South African historians. And it was an interest which never really took off. Um, first of all, I think those studies, at the time they were written, were adrift from any clear political project. And secondly, perhaps more importantly, by the time of the conference around the turn of the millennium, um, social history was on the back foot globally and locally. Um, and it seemed unable to muster the theoretical and historiograph hist historiographical resources necessary to defend and renew itself in the face of multiple, multiple challenges to Marxist-inclined historiography. Dismay. The new millennium marked the rise of cultural studies in the South African Academy. And if we agree with a fellow called Alistair Bonnet, there really are two strands in the whiteness field. Um, one concentrating on whiteness as a factor in historical process, class formation, something which changes over time, and the other concentrating on how whiteness shapes the so-called lived experience. I think it would be safe to say that earlier studies in South Africa, such as those undertaken by, 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 by Deborah, by John, by Robert, um, were more aligned to the historical tendency, but later ones were more concerned with the sociology, the ethnography, the language, the aesthetics of contemporary white experience and identity. This is where whiteness studies in South Africa would coalesce in the millennium. Again, not that different to what it looked like elsewhere. Um, now a few comments on the blends and tones of scholarship that came out of this intellectual milieu. Melissa Sustain is undoubtedly the doyen of this wave of whiteness studies and at a 2014 conference she identified the core premise of whiteness studies. Um, she said that whiteness is primarily about power and that it's remarkably resilient largely due to its capacity to transform and remain invisible. Okay, I, I, I guess we can't argue with this, but what power? How does it work? In, in what ways is whiteness resilient? Are there different racisms? So the stating of the fairly obvious, the sense of detachment from real engagement with contexts and social relations and the operation of capitalism seem emblematic, emblematic pardon me, of this version of whiteness studies. That conference represented the high tide of these sociological and sociolinguistically inclined whiteness studies. Um, and, yes, uh, pardon, um, sorry, a journalist Ferial Hefferge, um was one of the keynote speakers at that conference and in a critique of the program which was marked by both irritation and impatience she railed against this, this sort of esoteric nature of whiteness studies um, and its precious navel-gazing on minor issues. I'm paraphrasing her. I wrote it down while she was talking. To quote, she said, Why not share your swimming pool, sponsor a kid's school fees, or give half your wealth away, as businessman Patrice Motsepe did? This is better than self-obsession. Her taunt about self-obsession the irrelevance and most particularly the boredom of whiteness and whiteness studies certainly struck home. And it was a low point, a moment of self-indulgence where historians, especially social historians like me, were nearly completely marginalized 
we've been unable, unwilling to intervene in debates about whiteness and to point out the political and analytic problems which came from thinking outside of history and failing to anchor discussions of whites to bigger discussions about, about race. Challenge. If you recall, I said at the beginning that the methodology of this lecture is to look at how the politics of the time shaped the ways in which historical questions about whites in South Africa are framed. Now, could the political moods of the moment, I wonder, assist us to think of different ways to ask questions about the histories of whites, questions which could connect this history to important contemporary political projects to help us re-energize the subfield of social history by making us think about both its limitations and its possibilities. Now, as some might have noted, one of the strongest currents in local higher education, intellectual and activist circles today is the demand for decolonization. There are lots of internal differences, but those within the decolonization movement generally agree that until racial hierarchies and whiteness as a system of both privilege and exclusion are dismantled, post-apartheid society remains a bitter well of disappointment despite the formal end of racial discrimination. They have a particular interest in the way in which racial categories have emerged, how they operate and how they change. And in parts of the decolonization movement, there's also a deeply humanist strain, although I do have colleagues I know who would disagree with me on this. This strain notes that segregation, apartheid, colonialism, segregation, and apartheid dehumanized both black and white people. And they ask whether and how we may write histories which challenge the binaries of race that organize these systems, which created silos that ultimately limit the humanity of both black and white. And I think this is an exciting moment and a serious challenge to histories with a historians with a passing interest in the histories of whites. Most particularly, the concerns of the decolonization movement invite us to think about the way in which racial categories emerge and how race works. And I think it's also a call for us as historians to contribute towards rehumanizing, perhaps rehabilitating whites by crackling the stifling set of assumptions about white identity that dictate what histories white people can draw on how they should conduct themselves, and how they should relate to people who don't look like them. And there are echoes here of Biko, who argued that a non-racial society could only be possible when structures of race were destroyed, and he also pointed to the important conscientizing, educating work that needed to be undertaken among whites. Um, now, in approaching this task, we need to be quite clear about why we write. This is not a parochial history of whites. It's not old-style history where, where black people disappear into some distant background or a footnote or are completely invisible. While white people might be the focus, this is a history of race. It's a history against race. And I must emphasize, moreover, that this is not meant to be a feel-good, add a human face to apartheid history. This is an uncompromisingly anti-racist history. It entails questions that disrupt and challenge structures of power, and as such, this represents the potential for an insurgent history. And it must be grounded in Marxism. Race is central to class formation, if not according to the abstract logics of capital, then in its historical unfoldings. Hard for us to talk of class formation and not talk about race formation in most societies. And the best studies of race and racism come from the Marxist tradition. And indeed, once we lose the capacity afforded by class analyses to develop critique of how race works across a range of settings shaped by contemporary capitalisms, we are kind of reduced to the self-absorption and ultimately the social and political conservatism of the top demonstrated by South African iterations of whiteness identity studies.
Now, briefly, a word about the type of Marxism we might productively use. For those who follow such things, um, one of the more public controversies among stalwarts of the old left wing social history were debates in 2013 and 2014 between Vivek Chiba and Pata Chatterjee on Marxism and the legacy of subaltern studies. This is esoteric and jargony. And I apologize to those who are not versed in the conceptual underpinnings of social history or Marxism theory for this. I apologize, but I ask you to bear with me just for a moment. Now, Chatterjee and a collective, historians, and a collective of historians called the Subaltern Studies Group refused to be bound by the primacy, the domination of class as a category for analyzing society. And they argued that society was organized according to other categories which were equally important. In their case, they were Indian historians. They said cost might be, might be the foundational and most significant place to begin looking. And Chiba attacked Chatterjee for breaking the left into what he called isolated cabals, as he and others like him replaced class, which was Marxism's traditional tool of analyses, with all sorts of other categories. This debate makes us think about the types of Marxism we want to bring to a social history of whites. And I go with the Chatterjee group, who hold that even if we move away from the universal, universalism of class as a category and acknowledge the actually existing historical conditions and categories, this doesn't necessarily erode the foundations of, of class analyses. Why does this matter? With respect to a history of white position, of, of, with respect to a history of white people, this position summons us to think ethnographically and empirically. It guides us to a lower level than class, to smaller sub or parallel structures of organization. The dissident, the family, a group of civil servants, a crowd, all of whom might or might not be members of a working class, broadly defined, but at that instant that we're looking at them are bound by other relations. And this is where we find shreds of humanity, contrariness, alternate racial identities, types of popular violence, um, all of which are central to the type of questions the decolonial agenda urges us to pursue. Having proposed those entry points, these qualifications for new histories of whites, what could such a history, certainly for the apartheid period, which is the one I've worked on, entail? Before we do this, two points of clarification. Firstly, social history is about the history of ordinary people, about non-elites. We do have to be aware, though, that identifying apartheid's white subalterns or ordinary people is by no means an exact science of economic status or class composition, as Afrikaner nationalist anxieties and the social programs these activated added whole social groups to the mix, drunkards, prostitutes, even those most respected and honored members of white Afrikanerdom, mothers. And secondly, as Deborah Posel has reminded us, histories of below, of ordinary people, can no longer just be histories from below. Um, put differently, social worlds are made from the top and from the bottom. So, given this apartheid state's centrality in shaping white as well as black lives, its evolution is a logical starting point. And questions from a focus on the lives and experience of ordinary whites could begin by considering how elites in the state sought to make white people into racialized citizens. The ideologies they produced, the methodologies of discipline, and governance these officials drew on to inscribe particular ideologies, beliefs, and ideals into the daily routines of white life. It, consider, it could consider the legislative and administrative apparatus of the apartheid state and how this shaped and organized and controlled white, the lives of white people. And certainly, um, such questions have been posed widely and quite successfully of the black experience in South Africa, but are generally absent in the historiography of whites. Now, among the apartheid government's first major legislative moves were laws to establish work colonies, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, and laws prohibiting white people having sex with or marrying people of other races. 
And the fact that in its early years, the apartheid state's legislative program concentrated as much, if not more, on white than blacks makes this question significant. Ideology, science, and the role of intellectuals must feature prominently in questions on the ways in which elite whites sought to constitute whiteness. This could extend to the ways in which ideology was made real for ordinary whites. Let me give you an example. In the early apartheid years, social science became increasingly important in Afrikaner nationalism. And anthropologists looked at black people, sociologists looked at white people. And these social sciences assumed a significant role, their research did, in underpinning and organizing state policy. Now, intellectuals from the Afrikaans-speaking universities, like one Jeffrey Cronier, recipient of an honorary doctorate from this university, um, who was a sociologist and a technocrat, besides having an honorary doctorate, exercised considerable influence within the state as members of boards, as advisors, as appointees to senior civil service jobs. Um, if it sounds familiar, I'm talking about 50 years ago, comrades. Um, now, their published work has received attention from scholars, notably Aletta Norval and Saul de Beau. But I think if we're going to examine how the screeds of stuff produced by these intellectuals had any impact on white everyday life, we need to do more than simple intellectual history. We need to explore how, in fact, these ideas penetrated the realms of everyday life. Thus, let's take an example from Cronier. He was concerned that idle, degenerate, lazy white men posed a threat to white society and that they could be reformed. He was able to parley his influence and prestige to drive the development of apartheid-era work colonies, which were labor camps, and they were stuck in really out-of-the-way places, um, and they were designed for white men, where these white men were sent for three years, and they were punished, and they were recycled as, as sort of petty state officials. The men who ended up there were drunkards, homosexuals, and men in mixed race unions. Oh, and those who, in the opinion of social workers, failed to care properly for their families, which was rather broad, as you might see. Now, these unfortunates were sent to the work colonies for three years, and it is significant that they were not sent there by a magistrate or under the order of the court, but by bureaucratic fiat, their committal was signed by a social worker, and Jeffrey Cronier trained most of the social workers at the University of Pretoria. And on admission to these work colonies, and before they were left, they were given three exams. A medical exam, and see the weight and so on, a psychological one, and a sociological exam, which was designed by none other than Jeffrey Cronier, and which included slightly odd questions about church attendance and masturbation. Um, I've tried to show how some questions of these sort can and should fit into a history of whites, shaped by the ch challenges that the decolonization agenda poses and the extent to which that they, 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 they tell us how particular styles of being white were made and shaped and, 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 and how those who stepped outside of those parameters were policed and punished and reformed. Now, I don't propose to do a laundry list here. Um, and there's many such examples. But we, let's turn to a historiographic problem at this point. There's a problem of asking just these sort of questions. Questions about ideology. Questions about representation. Questions which began to feature prominently in historiographies globally through the first and much of the second decade of the millennium. One only has to look through the titles of the discipline's major journals. Um, now, as Sumit Sarkar, an Indian social historian, wrote, a focus on how the subaltern, how ordinary people are represented, raised the intellectually and politically debilitating possibility of reifying the subaltern. In short, he warned against the danger of producing, I quote, a dull hagiography of the subaltern, unquote. 
a subaltern without agency, energy, contrariness, or will. Now, in studying histories of whites, this kind of top-down approach that Sarkar warned of all too easily skirts questions of agency and leaves the way open for assertions which are ultimately cynical and in bad faith of plausible deniability about apartheid. That, well, I didn't know about it. That argument cannot ever be sustained historically, morally, or politically. So let's return then to the agency, the action, and the consciousness of subalterns. The idea of resistance was the organizing theme for the first for social history mark one, let's call it, of the 1980s. Um, but I don't believe that it is in any way appropriate for understanding white work, life, culture, and society under apartheid, where rather than resistance, ideas like accommodation, popular complicity, collusion, and co-optation are more apt. And we might begin by asking questions about the material, ideological, and cultural grounds for accommodation, taking care to sort of tease out gender and ethnic or class differences. Um, and certainly, the expansion of the civil service, where between 1946 and 1960, the percentage of, of, of whites virtually employed in the, in the civil servants virtually doubled, represented a very real material quid quo pro for accommodation, or what sociologist Michael Burroway has called the manufacture of consent. Yeah, these guys get good jobs. It was the biggest affirmative action project the country's ever seen. Of course they weren't going to raise any political or moral objectives to what they saw around them. We might also ask how whites defied, even symbolically, the citizenship and racial ro rules imposed from above. We might investigate the, fi the fate of whites who transgressed these codes, both written ones and unwritten ones, remembering that just as they transgressed, it's highly unlikely that their transgression actually represented resistance to apartheid and white supremacy itself. Instances of transgression and defiance are really hard to find and don't feature much in the secondary literature on the apartheid years. A wonderful exception is Katie Mooney's study of ducktails. And the men who were detained in the work colonies also represent another example. These men defied the discipline which came from being committed to the work colony. They ran away. They smoked dacha. And in the words of a superintendent, they carried on with native women. Um, and I have, however, not found a shred of evidence of any of them repudiating the privileges of whiteness. And in Another example, sometimes we find white civil servants um, seeking alternate cosmologies to make sense of the world. Not Protestant, not Calvinist, and not even Christian. There's evidence of these civil servants seeking Eastern insight and wisdom from a character in Lang Lachter in Johannesburg who was known as Divit Yogi. Now, you will notice that even at this moment when the religious authority of the church is challenged, Divit Yogi and his civil servants, what do you call them, congregations, clients, play the game of apartheid respectability by emphasizing that even though he's Yogi, he's Vit, he's white. Um, now, apartheid was violent. And we can look at the histories of racial violence, both state violence and popular violence, and at the oddly surprising types of punishment which were imposed upon those whites who claimed for themselves the state's prerogative to violence. What does this tell us about the state? In what ways did ordinary whites performing acts of racist violence upset the style of race and class relations? the form of racial domination that underlay apartheid statecraft? And what does it suggest about the fact that, that apartheid society may have in fact incorporated many, perhaps competing variants of racism and white supremacy? Another example. In 1957, one G. O. Opperman, who was a clerk in the Department of Labor, was riding his bicycle, 
in the corridor of an office when, I quote, his progress was impeded by a native who was walking through the doorway. It appears that this annoyed opperman, who, I quote, thereupon assaulted the native. Now, oddly, and this is 1957, Opperman is discharged from the public service. He's charged by the police and he ends up in Pretoria Central Prison for three months. Of the African, nothing, not even a name after his brief and unpleasant experience as the subject of Opperman's racial assault. But this episode generated volumes of correspondence in the archive and it suggests that the kind of violence displayed by Opperman upset the sort of order imagined under apartheid where violence was bureaucratic and the prerogative of the state, even if it was often murderous. Um, equally interesting, perhaps easier on the heart, are histories across the colour line. Um, and these histories across the colour line and to also focus or, or, or touch on questions raised by advocates of decolonization, how colonialism, segregation and apartheid dehumanized not only blacks but also whites. And they also highlight something of the kind of effective shifts necessary to move from crossing the color line, participating in something of a shared humanity and stepping back into the racial lagers of South Africa. An example. I grew up in a working class neighborhood and my mother Sheila had a great interest in horse racing. Not for her the glamour of the track, going to the July and all that nonsense, but figuring out small wages to place with a local bookmaker. Horse racing took place in those days on a Wednesday and a Saturday and she would spend Tuesday and Friday nights at the, at the, at the, at the dinner table in our kitchen with her friends Mrs. Goldstone and Mrs. Naidu, drinking tea, sometimes a little bit of cane, um, smoking and debating form. Now under South Africa's race laws, neither Mrs. Goldstone nor Mrs. Naidu were classified white. And while these three friends met primarily to figure out how to beat the odds, their time together was convivial and it represented a friendship that included favours and exchanges well beyond horse racing. Now under apartheid order, this represent the, the, these, the, these histories represented little acts of defiance humble and mostly unnoticed enactments of histories across the colour line. And it was a Tuesday and a Friday night thing. Instances such as those are not widespread. They're not, um, yet I think they do, they do rupture older, mainly Afrikaner nationalist narratives about the homogeneity, the coherence of white society and frankly also newer black nationalist narratives about that coherence. And I think they provide some pathways into a historiography and pedagogy against essentialized whiteness. Now, all of the questions which I've suggested take on the idea of whiteness as a blanket category, an unproblematic and ahistorical unity. They raise questions about the production of racial categories and point to the sum point to something of what was demanded, some of the humanity that had to be surrendered in return for the material and social privileges of being white. Um, and I think they also elucidate the basis of moral questions, for instance around defiance and its limits, violence, and also about histories across the color line. As such, I would, I, I, I believe that such histories of whites help us to unmask whiteness. A word on allyship. Anti-racism must be the core political project of any new social history of whites, or more precisely, a, a social history of race. Indeed, research questions, however sharply these are posed, are not enough. The moment of decolonization demands something more. It demands public pronouncements. It demands action. It demands stepping out beyond the seminar room, the classroom, or the lecture theater. And just as I had argued earlier that, that new histories need to be shaped by some of the concerns raised by the decolonization movement, we as professional historians should actively seek allyship with activists 
and intellectuals from the decolonization movement and anti-racist act activists more generally. Frankly, if we're not listening to debating, organizing from people like Patience Debatu, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, we run the risk of self-indulgence, of irrelevance, of losing the balance between a focus on whites and not becoming too parochially absorbed in the subject matter and of not paying attention to how these questions connect to bigger questions about race, politics, and in the local context, decolonization. And of course, we, by withdrawing and not engaging, we minimize the importance and miss the opportunity to build anti-racist political and teaching coalitions, which for me are the gold star, the capstone of this kind of work. A final point. It can't remain so that social histories of whites are written exclusively or even largely by whites. As David Rodiger has pointed out, some of the most important insights into the souls of white Americans come from African Americans like James Baldwin, W.E.B. Du Bois and Bell Hooks, whose secret knowledge comes from, I quote, seeing without being seen. So too, and yet, so too in South Africa, yet I seldom see white historians citing, for instance, Biko on the white condition. Based on their experience on the other side of the color line, black writers are very well positioned, I believe, to comment on how whiteness works, how racism works, in routine and everyday kind of ways. And I think we should be encouraging black scholars, postgraduates, to take on these unfashionable subjects. Perhaps, indeed, we need to emphasize that these are histories of race rather than histories of whites. Now, to conclude then, what I've looked at today, I've argued for a new social history of whites that draws on some of the abiding strengths of older models of Marxist-inspired social history, notably attention to class and relations of production built on a, and built on a self-conscious sense of insurgency. Indeed, Chibber's critique of Chatterjee is like a blast as he insists that our understanding of social phenomena like race, white supremacy, and racism must be situated within an exposition of capitalism. A point two made cogently by David Rodiger in his recent book, Class, Race, and, and Marxism. So, 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 so while it draws on class analyses, this new history isn't as wedded as closely to class as older versions of social history, acknowledging, I think, the historical historiographic and political critiques of this formulation. This new history also ranges around studies of power, ideology, representation and linguistics, drawing on the methodologies and the approaches developed since the heyday of Thomsonian social history. So, while I acknowledge strong Marxist roots for this kind of new social history of whites, I'm not arguing for a return to Marxism's grand narratives. Um, it may, however, be possible to connect this type of social history to smaller scale emancipatory ends, themselves tied to a critique of capital and the categories it produces and sustains. As far as our social history goes, this means ruthlessly shattering the idea of whiteness as a stable and homogenous category. It means writing with understanding, with empathy, but never, ever trying to posit a kind of apologia, a whitewashed history, if you like. Um, and I think that this is, this is what a decolonial intellectual agenda demands of historians with an interest in whites. And while it's a more humble pursuit than the grand narrative of early social histories, um, it does situate ordinary white people at the center of analyses, albeit in more nuanced and complex ways than earlier versions of social history. Such histories, I believe, do not, cannot, should not claim to be regional versions of theory or history from the South. Such histories should also not try to be copycats of work produced in other academies, in the Northern Academies, while all the while acknowledging the debts we owe scholars and activists like David. Um, but they are instead histories of below that are founded on the genealogy 
of particular intellectual and political developments and cast in very, very specific historical moments. And I hope that this kind of history represents only, not only a turn to a style of the activist insurgent history that attracted me to the discipline so long ago, but helps us rethink the values, the limitations, and the possibilities of social history within the discipline of history. Thank you.